So today we'll begin our study of kinematics. Kinematics is basically the study of motion, and this root word kinemats actually means movement. It's a, of Greek origin, and uh, that's also the origin of the word cinema. You can imagine if you just replace the K, you can see the word cinema in there, and that's obviously motion pictures. So anything starting K-I-N-E, this generally refers to um, movement of some type. Um, before we go too deeply into motion, we actually need to define a few terms that will kind of help us as we go a little deeper into the topic, and most important of which, and this will come up again over and over in the course, is the idea of frame of reference. Frame of reference is something that virtually everybody is intuitively understands what the frame of reference is, but they don't necessarily put it in those words, and so we need to be a little bit more articulate about what exactly frame of reference means and then how it relates to some of the other things that we're going to learn throughout the course of this uh, topic, kinematics. The definition of frame of reference is the observer along with the rulers and clocks that they use to make their observations. Now another way of thinking about the frame of reference though, besides thinking about the observer who is making these reference, these uh, observations I should say, is to think of it as the origin, the point from which you make all of your measurements. And, for example, um, one possible way of thinking about a, a frame of reference is, for example, the ground floor The ground floor of a building, when somebody is inside of a building, they will make reference to where their location is. And that location is always being made with reference to the ground floor. If they say they're on the fifth floor, or the tenth, or the thirtieth, or even in the basement, or even in one of many sub-basements. Um, for example, there may be more than one uh, basement level. So there may be B1, B2, B3, B4. All of these are making reference to that ground level being the first floor. Another good example is Chicago has a point of reference, a, a zero point, um, from which all of the addresses are measured. So if you, you take just a second, you might be able to think of what is the location of that zero point in the city of Chicago. So it turns out for Chicago, they placed the origin at state and Madison. And virtually every city has a similar sort of plan, particularly in cities that are set up as a grid, you know, that looks a lot like the um, coordinate plane that you've learned in your math class with an X and a Y axis. Well, Chicago has a similar thing with a north-south axis and an east-west axis. And if you're standing at State and Madison, then you're at the origin. State represents essentially the y-axis, separating the eastern side from the western side. And Madison represents the x-axis, which separates the northern addresses from the southern addresses. Um, highways also have a frame of reference. And for highways, it's typically the state border. So as you pass, for example, on Interstate 80 from Indiana to Illinois, you'll see that the numbers either start over, and they may either count up or down, but one of the state borders, either on the eastern side or on the western side, represents the zero, and then it counts the miles going one way or the other, and then in the other direction, it counts going downward. So the borders for most highways or interstates represents that frame of reference, that origin within that state. Just as Chicago has a zero for the addresses, the Earth also has a system set up to find locations. And for the Earth, that system is called the latitude. And for latitude, the zero is the equator. And so there are the maximum possible latitude is to go 90 degrees north, at which point you're at the North Pole, or to go 90 degrees south, at which point you would be at the South Pole. The other axis is called longitude. And for longitude, it is a line going from the North Pole to the South Pole, passing through Greenwich, England.
and there are a number of lines of longitude going around. The maximum possible longitude is going 180 degrees around to the other side of the Earth, 180 degrees west, or you can go in the opposite direction, 180 degrees east. The sky, which sort of you can imagine the sky as a, as a sphere that wraps around the Earth, that also has a, a coordinate system. And just as any coordinate system, it has its own frame of reference, and that frame of reference is measured in declination and right ascension. And it turns out the origin for uh, the sky turns out to be somewhere around the constellation um, Aries, the, the ram. So each of these refer to some point from which you would make your measurements, whether it be an address in the city of Chicago or a location on the Earth measured from essentially a line passing through Greenwich, England and the equator. That point represents the origin or the frame of reference for the Earth. And for the sky, similarly, there's a point in one of the constellations that represents the zero point from which everything is measured, either north-south, east-west. Similarly for Chicago, north-south or east-west. The tricky thing about frames of reference is that they can actually move. So I'll give you an example of a, a frame of reference that moves. You know, if you're inside of a, a bus or a car or a train or a plane, I want to stick with the buses, the trains, and the planes because you can move inside of those. In a car, you can move, but the, your motion is pretty limited. So let's stick with the bus, the train, and the plane because you're able to move uh, relative to them. So, um, for example, if you're sitting inside of a bus and you're sitting with a friend, you might see somebody that you recognize or you think you recognize um, sitting in another location in the bus. So you might tell your friend that, ask your friend, I should say, if they see the person in the second seat, in the second row. And if you think about that, as I said, this idea of frame of reference, it's, it's really intuitively understood by everybody. Everybody kind of knows how to use it in a simple way, um, but they just aren't as formal about it. So when you think about the idea of the frame of reference within the bus. You know, what is the frame of reference? Where is the zero point within the bus that you are making reference to? You know, if you say the second row, the person next to you will certainly know exactly where to look. If you say on the right or the left in the second row, they'll know exactly which spot or which seat to look at to look for this uh, person that you're referring to. And the reason is because, generally speaking, in a bus or a plane or a train, the point of reference is typically the front. Now you don't have to, you could use the back as your frame of reference. In that case, if you specify a location within the bus, you might actually say the frame of reference in the, the description of where to look. So you might say the third row from the back. So in that case, you're using the back of the bus as the frame of reference. Now it's really your right to use either the front or the back or really any place inside of the bus as your frame of reference. The key thing is to choose a frame of reference to make it clear what you've chosen as your frame of reference so that when you talk with somebody else or you're explaining to somebody else or conveying information to somebody else, they know what the frame of reference is from which you're making your measurements. Otherwise, obviously, if the frame of reference is not clear, then that kind of creates confusion for other people. You know what you're talking about, but nobody else understands what you mean. So, for example, within the front of the bus, the front of the bus moves relative to State and Madison. So we have this external frame of reference, State and Madison. It's relatively fixed, a relatively fixed location within Chicago. And then you have a second frame of reference. A second frame of reference is the front of the bus. And the two frames of reference are moving relative to each other. Now, to make the situation even more complicated, you might get up before you your bus gets to your stop. The bus is in motion. You're inside of the bus, walking towards the front of the bus, the door of the bus. And so you have not only the two frames of reference, the front of the bus, moving relative to State and Madison, but then you're also moving relative to the front of the bus. So you can see that it can get fairly complicated pretty quickly. Um,
And so we're going to go a little bit more um, deeply into the two-dimensional aspect and even the one-dimensional aspect of um, the, the relative motion of frames of reference. But for right now, it's, it's really enough for you to understand the idea that the frame of reference is this origin point, or essentially this point from which you make all of your, you, as the observer, you make all of your observations and you make your measurements with rulers or clocks or really any other thing that you can use for making measurements from that point of, of reference or that frame of reference. The second term that we need to think about in kinematics is this idea of displacement. The displacement is very uh, similar to distance. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's, it's pretty close. Um, so the definition of displacement is the straight line distance between the origin, and we just talked about the origin, the frame of reference, and the point of interest. So generally speaking, it's pretty unusual that very many people or very many things that you would be uh, that you would want to observe are going to just happen to be right at the origin so the d the idea of displacement is the straight line distance between that point of that frame of reference the origin and the thing that you're actually interested in displacement is a vector quantity that means that it has both magnitude meaning some number that represents and these generally will be in meters kilometers centimeters the same kind of units that you use for length and it also has direction, so it can point left, right, up, down, north, south, east, west. It could be represented by an angle. If we're thinking about a coordinate plane, we might use angles to represent the direction. But one way or another, the displacement contains information that has both the magnitude and the, direct, the direction because it is a vector quantity. It's very typical that we think about the plus or minus sign as being the way of thinking about the direction. That should really remind you of your math class when you're looking at the coordinate plane and you have both a positive side and a negative side of the axis and both the same in the y-axis also. There's a positive side and a negative side. Things can be moving in the positive or they can be moving in the negative. And so that plus or minus, you may not have thought of it in that, that manner, but actually the plus and minus is really the best way to think about direction because it's, an ac it's actually a mathematical way of thinking about it. That is to say that you could plug plus or minus into your calculator, whereas, for example, left, right, up, down, north, south, east, west, these are not things that can be plugged in mathematically into your calculator. It would be very difficult for you to do math. So instead, we take left and right, up and down, north and south, and we translate them into positive and negative. For example, we would typically call north going in the positive direction, south in the negative direction. Going to the right is the positive, going to the left is the negative. So this plus or minus translating into our other coordinate, other ways of thinking about directions allows us to do math with these, um, the direction portion of the, of the displacement. So just to give you an idea of what I mean by displacement, you might imagine a number line with an origin and we may have a positive vector And we might say that this vector is plus 6 on this number line. As I pointed out, vectors do not have to be positive. Vectors might also be negative. They do not also have to be only one dimensional. So we might have a, you might imagine a two dimensional coordinate system. And we might, for example, go 4 in the x, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 3 in the y, 1, 2, 3. Now, it's really important to recognize I went 4 steps to the right, I went 3 steps in the uh, y direction, in the positive y direction. But technically the displacement, this does not form a straight line, of course. The displacement would be the straight line displacement is the straight line distance and hopefully you recognize that that straight line distance would be 5 this is a 3 4 5 triangle and we have to come up with a direction well typically directions are measured starting from the x-axis and moving in the positive direction and I happen to know that this would be about 37 degrees so this vector is 5 at 37 
37 degrees. But of course, displacements don't have to point only in the positive. We might have instead of made four steps in the negative direction. One, two, three, four, and one, two, three, Now here's part of the trick. The displacement in this case, we use the positive value, and what we need is this bigger angle. So I know that this angle, the small angle in here, would be the same as it is on this side, 37 degrees, so that means that this bigger angle would be 180 degrees minus 37, which would be 143. So this is 5 at 143 degrees. And we'll really use both systems. We'll look at displacements both in terms of their straight line distance and the angle, and we'll also, at times, we will break those displacements into their coordinates. So the coordinates, if I break up this 5 at 37 degrees, that would be ne positive 4 plus 3. And if I break this one up into its components, it would be negative 4 and positive 3. So it's going to be really important to be able to switch back and forth between looking at the displacement, which is this one, or looking at its components, which are these two guys right there.